evening, everyone. My name is Greg Gorgon, the Executive Director here at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. I want to welcome you all here to the Maritime Museum. We have, a, obviously, a very big crowd. Any first time to the Maritime Museum folks in the audience? But thank you. Thank you so much for your support. It's through your support, at, through coming to these lectures and being members and attending all of our events that we are able to bring these great exhibits to the museum, bring uh, great lectures to the museum, and also do our education programs, uh, including uh, I should mention that we are not doing our marine science program this year because the ship that we have been, tall ship we've been using was uh, sold, unfortunately. But we are working on bringing that, a, a different uh, tall ship up next year uh, through the Ocean Institute. That's where we put sixth and through ninth graders on a tall ship for a three hour cruise. And they learn marine science by doing charting and navigation. They learn about plate tectonics and how the channel was formed, uh, the ocean food web, and what happens when you lose one of those species, how it affects others. Uh, and then in the uh, October, we are doing our fourth grade overnight program where the kids spend the night on the tall ship. They read two years before the mass by Richard Henry Dana and uh, spend the night living the life of an 1830 sailor. So that's a great program. We had 535 fourth graders on board that uh, this past October. So, uh, no, the adults cannot get on the boat with the kids, sorry, unless you're a parent. All right. We are very excited tonight to have uh, two great speakers and possibly even a third guest, right? All right, uh, so let me introduce you to our speakers. Alan Salazar has been a Native American traditional storyteller, a paddler of Chumash Tamals, and a Native American consultant and monitor. His family has traced their ancestry to the Chumash village of, and I apologize because I am gonna not pronounce these names at all very well, but Ta'apu, known as the, uh, now known as Simi Valley, and the Tatavian village of Piing, Near, I can't even pronounce Castia, California. Uh, he is a founding member of the current. Did I get is it close enough? Close for yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he is a founding member of the Kern County Native American Heritage Preservation Council, the Chumash Maritime Association, and a member of the California Indian Advisory Council for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and a member of the Environmental Review Board for the City of Malibu. Alan helped build the first working traditional uh, Chumash plank canoe constructed in modern times and has paddled in this plank canoe for over 15 years. He was, uh, has been involved with protecting Native American cultural sites for 20 years as a consultant and monitor on sites in Ventura, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and Kern counties. He is one of the few consultants and monitors that has taken college classes in archeology span and has worked in the field as an archeologist uh, to help him better understand the field. And he has self-published the first ever Chumash coloring book featuring important Chumash animals and the Chumash language. He has also worked as a juvenile institution officer for approximately 20 years at juvenile facilities in Santa Barbara and Bakersfield, and believes by sharing his knowledge about the Chumash and Tatavian cultures, he is saving these rich native cultures. Ray Ward is a native Barbarino, and after a time raising his family on their horse ranch in the Skook, um, Skookumchuck River in Washington State, moved back here to Santa Barbara. He has shared his ancestry and the tradition of paddling a tamal with his sons in the 2006 Santa Barbara Channel Crossing and continues to be involved with the Chumash community. He has participated and supported the revitalization of the canoe culture with both the Northwest Tribes and the Chumash Maritime Association. He has been at our museum many, many times for our sea festivals. And he has worked as a tradesman, businessman, and general contractor while enjoying surfing, diving, hunting, fishing, and martial arts. So th please welcome our speakers from the Southern Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was born in San Fernando, California, where my Native American ancestors are from. So they were brought into the San Fernando Mission when the San Fernando Mission first opened up in 1797. And uh, as Ray said, we've traced back to the, the Chumash village of Tuapo, which is where modern day Simi Valley is, and the village of Paying up by Castate, California, on the Tataviam side. Uh, but tonight I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about my involvement with the maritime part of the culture of, of the Chumash, uh, something that I consider a blessing to be involved with. In 1997, I, I just moved to. Well, actually, I'm, I moved to uh, Ventura in the uh, winter of 95, just before the big storm and the end of the pier in Ventura was washed away. I went to work here in Santa Barbara, at the Santa Barbara Juvenile Hall, the year that the pier, Stern's Wharf, caught on fire. 
So I've been asked not to move to any other coastal towns that have peers <laughs> since then. But uh, I'd only lived in the Ventura area for, for a while and uh, was asked if I wanted to be involved with the construction of some traditional shoe mash plank canoes, some tamales. And at the Maritime Museum here in Santa Barbara, uh, was going to build uh, three tamales, uh, Peter Holworth. Uh, was going to oversee the construction of these tamales, and one of them was going to be for the Shumash community. And uh, we named the last one that uh, uh, Peter oversaw the construction of Eliwayun, which is swordfish. And uh, I, I helped uh, uh, with Crescenzio Lopez and, and, and Roberta Cadero and, and Jimmy Joe, when Jimmy Joe was about that big. Uh, we, we, we helped finish the tamal that's on display here, and then we started working on Eloise. And it was an honor and, and, and pleasure for me to, to, to help build Eloise and to be there in that first crew on Thanksgiving weekend, 1997, when we put her in the harbor here and started paddling in her. Uh, we, we practiced and, and paddled for, for several summers and then thought that uh, we were good enough paddlers uh, to do a long journey. We paddled up to Carp down to Carpinteria a couple times, out to the oil uh, rigs off the coast here. And uh, after some discussion, we decided on paddling back out to Limu, the island that we now call Santa Cruz Island. And we planned the journey for the second weekend of uh, September, after Labor Day weekend, September 8th, 2001. Uh, we're gonna show the video, and I'll kinda narrate a little bit over it, and, and give you a little history uh, uh, about our plank canoes. Uh, the shoe match, we've been building these plank canoes for at least several thousand years. Uh, I, I personally think probably longer than that. Uh, uh, when, when the ocean waters raised and, and moved the coastline back, the islands went from being 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 miles off the coast to 10, 12, 20 miles off the coast. And we came up with the technology for the plank canoe. And uh, we, we uh, uh, built them up until about the 1820s. And in the 1820s and 1830s, the last few traditional tamales like this one were built in Ventura and Santa Barbara. Lived only on the islands off the coast of what we now call California. The times were very good then. Our people lived a long time. Young Marcus hasn't aged at all. How, how'd you do that, Marcus? <laughs> when you see me, you'll see how much I've aged in the last 16, 17 years. Of course, I had my hair dyed <laughs> so I could get the senior discount on Taco Bell. Uh, flat bottom canoes, and it'll show here at the beginning of the, of, the, uh, of the video. Flat bottom canoes sit on top of the water, so they're very tippy. They'll rock back and forth. So you have to put ballast or weight in them. We would put several hundred pounds of trade items to go out to the islands to trade with the Shumash people that lived out there. Today we put sandbags in the bottom bars. So in Eloayun, she's a 24-foot canoe. We put about 350 to 400 pounds of sandbags for ballast. Well, that's because we're studs. Um, and the red and white uh, there. It was the first time since 1834 that Chumash people had returned as a community to the village of Swahu on the island of Limu, now known as Santa Cruz Island. My love is for the earth and for the ocean and for traditional people to reconnect themselves to their homelands, to the habitats where they belong, is um, the work of my heart and so important. We can't ever separate ourselves 
from the knowledge of being part of the earth and the ocean. We're never not part of it. We're never not part of nature. But the only way we can understand how to be well, how to heal ourselves, how to heal the earth and the ocean, is to go and do something there. And that lesson, and all those lessons that are connected directly to our habitat, are at the heart of our work. While the crew prepared with prayers for the historic crossing, Chumash families already gathered at Swakul were also praying for their safe journey. We left at 3.45, but we didn't realize Alan, was that those four years of practice prior to 2001, we never practiced at night or in the dark. So this, this was the first time those five paddlers when we paddled out of this in harbor had paddled in complete darkness. For a reminder darkness. of the crew's inner uh, Channel Islands Harbor, Ox Island. Uh, the spiritual uh, and cultural values that would sustain A little bit closer, about 20 miles straight from uh, Channel Islands to uh, The lights are just so that the support boat support can see us. When we started early in the morning and our crew started <laughs> Cross into the darkness. We were visited by many of our, of our relatives. In the pre dawn darkness, the crews on the support boats, Just Love and Sandu, keep track of El Yetun by radar and by the bobbing of the small signal light strapped to a pole on the Tomo. Crossing into, into the channel in darkness was something like crossing into one's memory. I think some of the most touching moments were when it was still dark and there was just a little light on the tunnel. We had a special thing rigged up to have this light and also to have a way for the radar to track her. Sometimes we could see that little light out over the darkness and that was all we could see. Sunrise, 6.42. The first Tomo crew has paddled across choppy waters through three to four foot swells. Support crew and other Tomo paddlers on the Just Love sing the sunrise song to the Tomo crew who raise their paddles in salute to the new day. We've gotten a little bit better as paddlers. We, we don't paddle with five paddlers anymore. We paddle with four. Ocean. We put less weight. So to the eastern end of you Italy, notice she's riding very low. Anacapa Island. We, we, we have Takes a little bit higher now than the water. Near the eastern end of Anyapak is the southbound shipping lane. The support boats, captained by Ed Cassano of the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum and Matt Kelly of Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, alert all nearby vessels and the paddlers crossed the strong current of the shipping lane safely. There were times when we were in perfect unison. Fantastic. Everyone following <laughs> the stroke of, of the, the lead paddler. And the paddles hitting the water at the same time, coming out and going back in the water at the same time. That, that feeling of, of teamwork and, and, uh, and unity, uh, it, it's, it, it, it makes you feel good and you feel good about yourself. Along the way, they encounter the islander en route to Limu with several Chumash families on board. Chumash people on the Just Love and Chumash people on the islander sing to each other across the water while El Yewon and her crew paddle close enough to salute the people. Also on the islander were some people doing a reenactment of the Cabrillo landing. They were going to San Miguel Island. So some of those Shumash people that got over my aunt and uncle. And here's a group of Shumash people and they look and they see all these people dressed in Spanish 1700 art. It was an awkward moment. <laughs> Arch at uh, Anacapa. The first crossing took us 12 hours, and that was part of the reason we did a little zigzag. As El Yeun leaves Anyapa for the big island of Limu, the wind switches to a westerly direction, opposing the tidal current. 
creating steep waves out of the three to five foot swell. A slow leak in one That's of the pipes in the front. causes El Yemo to you take the water so fast three paddler, that times three paddlers must bail at once. We, we it was probably very scary also almost because a foot of water in the bottom from of the having that, been part of the early El Yemo, knowing really the fragility of this boat. Kahu Utash, he stand suna lose moon, hul mor mor ibush. He ka sip, kaka no mawa, is king moon. One of the things that I noticed, uh, particularly the morning of the uh, the paddle itself, were the number of ravens that were down at Scorpion uh, on the island of Limu. Ravens are common birds anyway, but that particular morning, uh, there seemed to be more ravens than usual. The ancient site of Suakyu, the largest village of the northern Channel Islands, comes alive as Chumash families gather at Scorpion Cove campgrounds to welcome and yet Most of the families had never been to their island homeland, but a village was born again on Limu, and the spirits of the ancestors rejoiced. So on this island, uh, I had an opportunity to experience what it is like to be part of a community that identifies with the ocean, with a spirit, and with a community of compassion and love, of, uh, of balance, being in in balance with one another for the, for the whole three days. It was amazing. Activities in the camp flowed naturally as Chumash families visited one another. It felt so complete and right and open and welcome. It was as though the island had breathed a sigh of relief. Words and phrases spoken in the old language resonated throughout the campground. When I was on top of the hill, I saw the, the Tomo coming. First, I thought it was just a regular boat. I was just, I waited for like at least 15 minutes, just staring at it, making sure I didn't want to bring everybody over there and make a mistake. Now, if you notice, so now we have four paddlers. Yeah. Yeah. So when we take on all, all that water, we're riding real low. We took one out. of our paddlers out. Seen Not really so that that lot of paddles in the air. She came up a like little bit. Signaling that we were able to make they were it. coming. When El Yetwun and the paddlers rounded the bend of Scorpion Cove, and raised their paddles. Marcus Sr. there in the red vest. It was He's our oldest paddler. He's 184. <laughs> <laughs> is he here? If, if he is, he doesn't even realize it. Probably. Time fell away, <laughs> and the people were holy. Young Marcus, tell him I said this. The gentleman right there, he, he, the name was Paul Hitt. That was the, the fifth one that we took out. We took Dan out, the canoe came up quite a lot. So you can see Dan's a big man. Reggie Pagel, Luke Pagel, the second paddler right there. He's the captain and builder of Luke and mine. Our, our 30 foot small from San Diego. Dennis, Dennis moved up north. journey over the deepest ocean of loss and sorrow, but we had made it back home. She called out to Kakunukmawa, Kakunukmawa, save your people, they are good people. And Kakunukmawa said, yes. And the people who were dying beneath the ocean, their bodies began to change. Their bodies became sleek and smooth. They could see into the water a long time. And they felt the life coming back into their bodies. And they were jumping out of the water, jumping out of the water, so happy to be alive. And the descendants of the Molokiwash 
The people we know call the Chemash people, they tell this story to this day to remind us that the dolphins are very close relatives. So she's referring to the Rainbow Bridge story. Gave me pride to be who I am. I get a lot of questions on my ethnicity. Not everybody can tell who I am. You don't go around seeing native tribes like Chumash and all of a sudden people know who you are, what ethnicity you are. So I get asked who, what ethnicity I am. Being on that island gives me pride to tell the people who ask me that I'm Chumash. I am not just Native American, but I am Chumash, a tribe from the One thing our maritime culture has done, it came along about the same time that there was a revitalization in many parts of our Chumash culture and many native cultures. So even the traditional Hawaiian people, ironically, were building their traditional sailing canoes the same time within a year of, of, of us building Halek in 1976 within a year of us building Eliwiyun. And one thing that, that I noticed when Art Cisneros was talking about when we, when we gather out on Limu, when we do our crossings, uh, it, it's like a Shumash village. It's, we're a community again. And we have forgot this over the years but when we go out to the island, we, we leave all of our disagreements over here on the mainland. Because you may find this hard to believe, there's some people within the Shumash community that don't care for me. I know that's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Stop and think about it, those of you that are older, in 1963, 64, 65, most of you guys didn't like Muhammad Ali. Now, we love him. So when I'm old and have Alzheimer's, I'll probably be more loved in the Shumash community. But for the most part, that's been our mantra, that, that we leave our differences and our disagreements outside of the Tamal, and we don't take them out to Limu. And it's gave us an opportunity as native peoples, because we have non-Shumash people and Shumash people. Uh, we have, we've had surfers paddle with us. Um, uh, the, the Mal is it Mallory? The, the, the Mallory? Boy. The Mallory boys have, 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 have paddled with us. Um, and yeah, Quinault from Washington. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, we, we have a lot of different people in, in, in our Tamals. And, but within the Shumash community, I, I think it was Eloi Yoon that brought the community together, helped, helped kind of push along the, the revitalization of our language. So in 2001, there were no language classes. In 2014, there's language, Shumash language classes th throughout Shumash territory. We have some here in Santa Barbara. Santa Inez has them on, on a regular basis. Uh, I, I know in Ventura. Uh, and Julie Tumamite, the nursing in Minnesota, hope to start having some. So, there, uh, but it, it all started in, in 97, 2001, 2002, 2003. Uh, and and I, I just believe that the, the, the Tamal, Elie Yum, just became a focal point for Shumash people. There's a reason to, to, to rally together, to say, you know what? I'm not a paddler, but I really enjoy learning the songs and the language. So there's some young people here that I go to and ask them questions about the language, ask them about songs. Because they've, they, they've, they've, they go and they, 
they, they paddle with us or they meet us on, on the island. Uh, uh, Johnny Moreno, who, who did the narration in the Chumash language, uh, uh, I think he's been in, in, in the Tamal once. Has bad knees, just can't paddle. But he probably knows more about the language than just about anyone I know. You know, one, one, of, one of the three or four best Shumash linguists that we probably have. And because we, we gather, he shares that wisdom with, with hundreds of people, hundreds of Shumash people. So it's just been a, 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 an incredible experience. Basket weavers, uh, you know, artists and craftspeople, storytellers like myself uh, uh, have, have come together to, to learn and, and to share. Uh, one thing that, that wasn't brought up in, 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 the, uh, in, in the video, uh, Roberta Cadero was, was talking uh, uh, about her love for the ocean. But I remember in 97 when we formed the Shumash Maritime Association. And there was six or seven of us. And um, uh, one of the first things we discussed was, are women going to be involved with the construction <laughs> of our tamal? Are women going to paddle? Because it's the brotherhood of the tamal. And trust me, there were some men out there, mostly my age and, and older, that felt we, we need to, to get back to the, to the traditional way. We need to get back to our tra traditional ways to save our culture. And I, 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 if I remember correctly, the involvement of women with, with our tamals was one of the first serious discussions we had as, as, as a group, as a Shumash Maritime Association. And the Shumash people uh, have always had women leaders. We have women leaders today. At European Contact, the head wot or chief of all the islands, not just one village, but of all the villages on all the islands was a woman. So because of that, because of the story of Slo, the great eagle, one of the sky people, a wot and chief, Slo's daughter going out fishing in her tamal, we believe that, that it's part of our culture. Yes, it was the brotherhood of, of, of the brotherhood of the tamal. It was usually the men who built the canoes and were the fishermen and the seamen. But Shemesh women have, have, have uh, had their own tamales, have fished, uh, and uh, have always been leaders. So, so we, we had women paddlers, and women helped build Illyun and, and, and most of our tamales in, in, in modern times. And it's something that, that I'm very proud of. And yes, it probably has to do with, as I've gotten older, I can't run as fast. So <laughs> if I don't acknowledge the Shumash women, <laughs> They'll probably beat me up. <laughs> but uh, I, I've uh, uh, paddled with, with, with many of them. Uh, uh, Tony Cadero, who, who I just think the world of. And we've had two historic crossings the last two years. Uh, 2012 uh, was the first time we never made it all the ways. We got swamped. Conditions were very rough. The winds were 20 knots. Swells were four to five feet. Uh, and we only took the 30 foot. We didn't take Ella We took the 30 foot moved to mine. And about seven, eight miles out, we uh, got sideways in the swell. And the swell came over the side, filled up half of the tamal. The next swell came 10 seconds later and filled it up all the ways. And it got filled up with water and swamped and we didn't make it. And we, we learned some lessons. And for me, the most important lesson that we learned from that year, 2012, when we didn't make it and we got swamped, was that the last two tamales 
that we think might have been probably the last two traditionally built by the Brotherhood of the Tamal in the 1820s in Ventura, the construction overseen by a Chumash named a man named Valentino, were lost in a storm off the coast of Ventura. And the one Tamal had over four or 500 pounds of fish that they were bringing back to feed the people at the Ventura Mission and got hit by a couple big swells and was swamped, and those men were lost at sea. The other canoe had thrown their fish overboard and their canoe was lighter, and they were able to make it ashore, but when they got close to the shore, the, the surf was so big that the, the, the Tamal got picked up by a 10, 12 foot wave and thrown ashore and, and smashed and broken in, into you know, 100 pieces. And we should have known that. Our elders in 1820, 1830, had, 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 had taught us that lesson that that channel is very dangerous. It's something that we have to respect. And last year, we hadn't, we hadn't learned the, the lesson apparently well enough, and we got in the same conditions. And we did learn enough that, okay, before it gets rough and we get swamped again, let's tie them up and tow them for a few miles and get closer to Limu, where, there's a, where the island breaks, the winds, and that's what we did, and, and we were able to make it. But sometimes it takes me a long time to finish the story. <laughs> Last year, I paddled in, in Muktamai, the 30-foot Tamal, and I hope this year to paddle in El Iwayun and Muktamai because I helped build uh, El Iwayun. So that's my public club. I have 60 witnesses here that <laughs> the captains of uh, El Iwayun better get me in there. Uh, yeah. But last year, the conditions started getting very similar to 2012 when we got swamped. And I paddled in the first crew that left at 3.30 in the morning. And we paddled from 3.30 to about 7 o'clock in the morning, three and a half hours. Fairly rough conditions, even it wasn't that calm when it, us it usually is fairly calm in the morning. And I got out of the Tamal, and because of 2012 being swamped, I, I got a bite to eat, and then I was kind of watching the paddlers. And I could tell that a couple of the paddlers were struggling. And after only about 40 minutes or so, they, we have radios, and they said, you know, we, we're going to have to switch out a couple of paddlers on that second crew. They're, they're having some cramping problems. They're already tired. It takes a lot of upper body strength to paddle on your knees with an 11-and-a-half-foot long wooden paddle. And I go... Um, I says, hey, I'll go back in. I said, I'm, you know, I'm okay. And they go, the, the captains got together and they go, okay, we're, we're going to put um, Eva and Alan in. Eva Pagaline is Reggie Pagaline's daughter. She's about 22, 23 years old. Uh, and I, I've, I've, I've watched her grow up as a paddler. She's paddled. In our, in our harbor, a mile or so off the coast. She's paddled the last half mile on, on one of our crossings. The, and the last half mile is, is the easiest half mile. And I told her when we got out of the Tamal that when they said Eva's going to get in, one of the reasons I volunteered was because I, I thought she was going to be in over her head. She would never had paddled in rough conditions in the middle of the ocean, you know, four to five foot swells going up and down. And they put her in the front, the number one paddler. That's a tough position. You got to set the pace, you know. Uh, you, you're, you're the eyes of the captain, you know, how the swells are coming. And, and, and um, I've, I've been number one paddler, so I figured, okay, I'll, I'll be number two. I can, I can carry her a little bit. Uh, we were in two hours in, in rough conditions. Not only did she not miss a stroke, she paddled harder than most of the men in the canoe that day. 
And both Eva and I, being in the front, got at least four five-gallon buckets full of water thrown at us. So we'd go down a swell, and we, it was so steep that you'd go down, and when you got to the bottom of the swell, the water would come over, and it'd be like a five, someone taking a five-gallon bucket of water and hitting you right in the face. Um, and we got out, and my, my friend Tom Lopez and his 16-year-old son got in. I've been paddling longer than, than, uh, than Tom's son has, has been on this earth. And I thought, he's in over his head. So when I got out, I went to the rail of our support boat, and I watched him for over two hours paddle. And he did the same thing that Eva did. When you're in water like that, and you're going up and down in a 30-foot canoe, what happens is you hit the, 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 the swell on this side. And as you're coming over with your paddle on the other side, sometimes the swell is going down. And you, all you get is air. And you have to, I mean, it takes total focus, total concentration, because you've got to take air but don't speed up your stroke, keep it at the same pace, then come back over and you're gonna catch the water on this side again. And hopefully you'll catch it on that side again. About five, six swells on down, you're gonna catch air again. So to paddle two hours in those conditions, 16 years old, I was able to do what Marcus, old Marcus, he's not 184, he's a year older than me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Roberta, Reggie Pagoline, Steve Villa, those of us that, that were, were, were there from the beginning, we, we said, if we can get the young people involved, then we've succeeded. And last year, I know of at least two of our young paddlers that became adult paddlers. And I'm not related to any of them, but they're like family to me. And I love them very much. And my dear friend Ray is gonna talk a lot about family uh, and his incredible family and their history with Lemu. Thank you for no spitting, no biting, and uh, I'll, I'll be up here for answers uh, later. And Ray, uh, it's all yours. Well, right now, I would like to um, introduce and bring up three generations from, from Santa Barbara, from, um, pardon me? Yeah, Siuktun, Santa Barbara. And um, I'd like to introduce, and what we're going to do is, um, a couple of years ago, we had a film crew um, from Arizona come up and, uh, and they have a company called Indigi Dreams. And um, we made some shorts. And so we're gonna show a few shorts from three generations of people from here. So I'd like to introduce uh, Martha Jaimes. I'm not a speaker, but I am Shumash. And with pride, I stand before you to tell you that this trip to Limu is so meaningful and so important and so from the heart. Um, we, I have a son who's a paddler. My sister is a paddler. My grandson, my granddaughter, my son-in-law. We all are, are dedicated at supporting our paddlers. Um, I, I made this Indigi video that you're going to see, um, and I hope you kind of understand where I'm coming from because there's been a few of us in that position, and that's why I try to work with our community today and every day and try to work with our youth and have 
our culture classes in my home and craft classes and trips. I have a op in our backyard where we did classes for the schools. Um, I think it's that important to teach our youth to carry this forward to know their beginning as well as we are standing here with pride knowing ours. My daughter, Mia, will speak to you as well, and my granddaughter, Lacey. We can see that video. My father and my mother died 18 years ago. Daddy was our protector and caregiver of a huge Cordero family that reached all Central California. Mother was raised at St. Vincent's Orphanage. At Daddy's funeral, there were many Spanish who recognized his family for many generations, all the way from Barcelona, Spain, and they referred to him as Don Antonio, meaning the person to go to for big decision making around education, raising a family, and financial decisions. I didn't understand how respected and revered he was until the day he died, when a lot of his extended family came from Northern California and told us stories about how he helped them. At his funeral, I also understood his necessity for protecting us. Daddy wasn't going to let people talk badly to us because of our ethnicity. We are who we are. It is how you take care of yourself, is what Daddy used to say. When Daddy went into this service, he picked a Catholic school, a private school, for us because he knew we would be protected. In the past, there were many histories, bad histories, about mistreatment of Indian people by non-Indian people. Daddy felt it was better if we were kept naive about those bad things and quiet about who you were. The best we could say was we were Mexican. It was a mixture, and it was better than if we said we were Indian. At eight years old, I started becoming more aware about who I was. I remember filling out a form when we were in school and asking, am I Spanish? Am I Indian? I remember Mariano Cordero. Didn't you say something about our Indian relatives who were married at the mission? My father said, yes, but just say you're Mexican. How come? How come? Because you don't want them to talk bad about you. You are Mexican. It is a little of this and a little of that. When my children started getting older, they started asking questions about who they were. I want them to know who they are, and I encourage that with pride. We started going to coastal band meetings and events and started participating. My granddaughter Callie dances in her regalia, sings, and was in a documentary beneath the Rainbow Bridge. My son David is a paddler of the Tomol, and he and my grandson are also intertribal bird singers. All my children are members of the coastal band of the Shumash Nation. Yesterday's teaching doesn't necessarily need to be forgotten. Let them be learning steps to educate tomorrow. I want my children and grandchildren to know their history, good and bad. I want them to know who they are. Be proud to know where you come from, what your ancestors were like, and what they lived through and how you are here today because of their contributions. Make contributions today for tomorrow. We are alive. Sukinanik Oi. Ki antikich, ki antikich, ki antikich. My grandfather was a very important person in our lives. And 
Um, he made a big impact on us, on the grandchildren, as well as people up and down the coast that our family wasn't even aware of until his passing. And at that time, I was young, but I had my first child. And my first daughter was able to meet my grandfather and be with him and know him. And he influenced my life greatly. And so my story is a continuation of my mother's story because what she started helped me to move forward when I became a mom and realized there's something more and I need to do that. When I was young, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather who taught me many things in life about what kind of person to be and what things were truly important. We would walk in the mountains and along the river and he would point out different plants, call them a silly name I did not know, and tell me what they could be used for, to heal poison oak, make a tea when you are sick, or put on your chest when you had a bad cough. As we walked, sometimes he would start humming, then quietly start singing. When I was little, I never asked what those silly words meant or who taught him those silly songs. I just loved being with him. As time went by, our days together grew farther and farther apart. School and friends occupied my free time more and more. When I became pregnant with my first child, I spoke to my grandfather often about the things I wanted to teach her. As a dancer myself, I wanted to teach her footwork, castanets, and everything she needed to know. One day, my grandfather asked me, will you teach her everything? Yes. Am I teaching my kids everything? In 1995, I started working at American Indian Health and Services with our Native community. I met people from our Chumash community and they would ask me who I was, what was my family name, and who are my parents and grandparents. At first, I thought it was all very personal, but then Every day, someone would say to me, Oh, we're related. When I had my second child, I finally knew what my grandfather meant. Will you teach her everything? Yes, I will teach them everything, just as soon as I can learn it myself. I started going to community functions asking elders questions, and learning about our Chumash culture. My husband, oldest daughter, and son are all paddlers for our Tomo. My youngest daughter is a beautiful basket weaver and traditional dancer. My girls still dance flamenco and Spanish classical dance, and my son has had his try at it too. I am confident now, as a mom, that if my grandfather were here with us, he would know that I have and will continue to teach my children everything. It is very important to me that my children know all about their heritage and cultures and embrace them. My kids know the silly names, silly words, and silly songs. They are no longer silly. They are Chumash. So I happen to be that firstborn daughter who my mother taught me everything and the number one granddaughter that my Nana has passed everything on to. So my Nana and my mom happened to touch on more of a family-related thing, whereas my place in the culture, I paddle. Paddling holds a very big place in my heart. 
So my video is called 3 a.m. It's one of the few times that I feel like we don't talk about too much. It's first thing in the morning. You know, we haven't slept in like over 24 hours. We're all super stoked to get started on our crossing. And the energy at that time is just so amazing. And then we all go and fall asleep. So <laughs> this is my video. I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, enjoy. <laughs> My name is Lacey Lopez, and I am a Chumash woman paddler. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. The cold wind and smell of the ocean engulfs me. Emerging from the big ship named the Explorer, I see her sitting in the dark water waiting patiently for the first crew of paddlers to take her home. Her name is Elia Un. She is 24 feet long and made of redwood. She is garnished with abalone inlaid in the shape of a swordfish. This smell of sage begins to fill the air as we bless the crew in our tomal for the 21 mile voyage she is about to embark on to the beach of Limu. It's an amazing feeling to know that I am part of such an incredible journey. She and the ocean have a bond that I am a part of. I feel the power of the ocean as though I am one with it. When you respect the ocean and are out in a plank canoe, be aware that anything is possible. It almost seems the ocean feels your understanding and helps you cross safely. When out on the open water, dolphins come to make your journey that much more memorable, jumping and flipping about as though to say, hey cousin. I have been out to the islands before on boats and seen dolphins follow for a couple minutes and then part ways. But when they see the tomol, I feel they are the ancestors following and reliving the time that they cross the channel. The pods that come are enormous. They bring the young ones right alongside as if to show them that we are their cousins and to never forget. They teach the young ones of the Tomo just as we teach our young ones. The dolphins are an amazing sight, but when Limu comes into view and you take in every mountain, every patch of green, and every cave, it takes you to another state of mind. One mile out, I can hear our family singing. It gives me that extra push I need to continue to pull the water and push the water. When we reach the shore and land, we see everyone, but also feel the presence of those who cannot be seen, those who have followed us from the mainland and crossed with us back home. Thank you, three generations of Corderos, Lopez, Jaimes. <laughs> um, we're gearing up here for another, queuing up for another DVD. And we're getting close, and I see Peter's still here. So it must not be too late. Um, so um, my name is Ray Ward Espinosa Cordero Ortega Lopez. Lugo, Carillo, on and on and on. I could go on for days. And I, and I know that um, I was up at the res m many years ago and when I had just moved back to Santa Barbara, my home, and, and the, the hall was, about, there was about 150 people in the hall. Nobody knew me. And I introduced myself and I used about 20 of my surnames. And when I got there, everybody was giving me this, you know, stare, you know. Sam Spaulding was, you know, just, you know. And, and, um, and when I introduced myself with all my surnames, you see this big smile on their face, you know, cousin, right? <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanted to um, just 
kind of briefly, this is a, this is a short um, film from 1976 with the first modern day tamal, um, the helek, that right now this, this tamal is hanging um, in, on the wall in the Fleshman Hall, I still believe, right, Jan? Yeah. Yep. And um, at the Museum of Natural History. But, um, but this, is, this is the first modern day tamal in, again, uh, partially circumnavigated all four Channel Islands in 1976. So that was, um, I forget how many days were, were they out on the water? Do you remember? Was it 10? 10? I think there were 10 days total out on the water. So um, kind of the revival of, of our, as Alan was saying, you know, that revival was going on in the, you know, here in the Northwest, all around the Pacific Rim, all, you know, and, and probably in many other places. But um, uh, when I was introducing myself, um, I, you know, I wanted to uh, acknowledge my eighth great grandmother, Maria Rosa, um, from from the island of Santa Cruz. Um, I wanted to acknowledge my great grandfather and his, um, Jose Espinosa and his brother Cuate Espinosa, who lived on Santa Cruz and worked on Santa Cruz Island from 1865 until 1926. Sixty years. They as as this town and this country was becoming a modern, quote, mo you know, US modern town. These guys were saying, no thanks. I'm living on the island. And that's where they lived and worked for 60 years. Um, Alan was talking about um, the last um, old Tamils. And um, there's, there's a story about Milqueres who, uh, who was born on Santa Cruz Island and, um, and brought to the mainland in, I think, 1811? Is that right? 1815. And you know, during that period, the last people were, you know, during this, the Spanish period, the last people from the, uh, from the islands were brought to the mainland. And um, part of all of that was because the whole economy had changed. You know, with, uh, with the missionization of Alta California, I mean, you know, the commerce in, in, in native economy had just changed, period. And um, so, and, you know, along with a lot of other things, but, but the, during the mission period, um, it was not New Spain's intention to um, what was their intention to incorporate the native population as citizens. So that was that, was that. along with taking their land and resources, of course, however. Um, um, in, um, you know, some of my relatives are, um, you know, the uh, Ortega family, and there were canoes in, still in the 1830s here in, in our, uh, the Dos Pueblos and um, Refugio um, ranch, rancherias, ranches. And, um, and in fact, my grandfather, times a few greats, Jose Dolores Ortega, was given a canoe in, um, in the 1870s after he had won a canoe race up at Refugio. Um, there's there's a lot of um, there's not a lot of historical writings, and there are a lot of historical writings. So there's both, um, um, and no surviving canoes into contemporary times. Only pieces, and so um, so we did our best in um, '76 with the help of a lot of people from the museum and others from our community, and continued to work on canoes in 
96 and 97 with the building of the El Yet Wun. Um, that, uh, that stuff was supported by non-native people um, uh, of whom are um, Harry Davis and Peter Howarth were, were facilitators and supporters of our community to make that happen back in 76. Mm -hmm. And Peter Howarth in, um, supported our community with uh, the building of several canoes in, in the late um, 90s. Since that, and since that time, our community has had only one canoe, the Elliot Wun. And I'm telling you, she is a grandmother who has so many miles on her, it's incredible. We, we had our hands on her today and took her back to the Tamol house today, and it was just good to be with her. Um, but since that time, um, my brother is, uh, is a Tamol captain and canoe builder. Um, our community, uh, we've built two Tomols up at my barn, and our community now has five canoes not one, five. And we're building our own canoes. I know a couple of years ago, I talked to Peter and talked to him about building canoes, and he says, Ray, you guys build them. And I said, yes, that's exactly what we'll do. So um, this is, uh, there's a few pictures here of, um, uh, there's Thomas Ward down there in the bottom left, and um, Cuate Espinosa in and, the and, uh, and, uh, top, le top left there. And these are old photos from, um, from Santa Cruz Island, sent the, the ranch out at Santa Cruz Island. And um, my, uh, my great grandfather was Maridamo you know, for many years on the ranch there in its beginning for, with the Care family. But he must have, um, um, made them mad because they took him out of the photo album. <laughs> <laughs> and I've talked to Jan and John about, you know, where, where's my, where's my great grandpa? And, you know, a lot of people have looked for his, for his uh, <laughs> photographs and not been able to find them. But. Um, you know, these are, you know, some scenes, you know, early, early, you know, recorded pictures of, of the workings of, um, of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, the east end of Santa Cruz was mainly sheep, you know, in, in those days when the Care family owned it, and, and the, the, the other three quarters, the west end of the island was uh, relegated to cattle and a winery, a very famous winery, um, Santa Cruz Island wi Winery. And um, of course, today, owned by Nature Conservancy, that three quarters and, and the National Park Service. But um, absolutely, anybody, if you ever get an, an opportunity to, to wander about the island or camp out there or stay out there for more than a day or two, you know, it's well worth the um, endeavor. There's Cuate. He, um, He lived solo most of his life with his dogs on the East End, Scorpion Harbor. So there's the ranch there. One of the other things that I just wanted to briefly mention is, and, and um, that is that um, also we made the first crossing, as you saw in, in 2001, from the mainland to Santa Cruz. But um, starting in 2011, we've been participating with the uh, canoe peoples of the Northwest, primarily of the Northwest that are, that are the hosts, and they're from Oregon, Washington, and Canada. And every year, there, um, there are about 10,000 people that come together for a five-day ceremony. How they get there is on the water in their canoes. So in the state of Washington today, with, if, if you look at Puget Sound, the Straits of Juan de Fuca, the Pacific Coast, 
the Straits of Georgia inside Canada around Vancouver Island and outside Vancouver Island. Today, there is a federally recognized tribal group within one day's paddle of each other. And when we go up to Washington and paddle with them, we paddle from village to village. The first time we went up there, we paddled 130 miles in seven days with, our, with Elliot Woon. So we got, gave ourselves an opportunity to learn something. And one of the reasons why I mentioned the fact that still today, up in the Northwest, federally recognized tribal groups within one day's paddle of each other. Because in the state of California, there is not one federally recognized tribal group on the coast south of San Francisco. Not one. Now you know this was a heavily, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. But not one. So, we speak to you and tell you some of these stories as native people, as people who continue today, thousands of people, contemporary people today, are native Chumash blooded people. So we're still here. And let me just say, we're happy to be here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and have fun, OK? Because, you know, so there's what you're looking at right there is uh, on the right is um, Channel Islands Harbor. And Scorpion Harbor on the left, that's the, the, the eastern end of Santa Cruz Island. So um, I know that when I, I'm, I'm one of the captains of the Tamil, and I, I know that you know, the first time that I was involved as a captain, we're having a meeting, and because and, um, and, and, the first time that we, that we had done the paddle, we started from here, and the thinking was, well, what's the What's the route going to be? So we said, well, it's shortest to come to yeah. Anacapa, right? 11 miles. OK, so that's what they did. I mean, I wasn't here. I sent them salmon, you know, but um, I wasn't here. <laughs> and so what they did was, it, well, you can see it's not a straight line, so it makes it longer. But also, once they got here, then you have all this current, and you have the current from oh. this big gap right here. And it was, it was a, a long, <coughs> tough pull, let me tell you. When I became involved with it, um, you know, when we we're doing the route planning, I said, you know, what's the, you know, the shortest way between two points? It's like, oh, a straight line. And that straight line, we were quartering, quartering the swell all the way. So that's basically what we do now. We just, we just draw that straight line and, you know, work with the wind and the swell and, and attempt to keep it a straight line. Um, but it doesn't always work that way. As, you know, you heard Alan, you know, I mean, it's like we had to get towed in last year. We were, and that was a new experience for us as well. I tell you, uh, when, when, we're, when we get up close to these vessels, you know, they're traveling 30 knots. The wake that they create, well, you've probably seen it on television. You can surf the wake, right? People surf that. So we try to stay as far away from them as we can. We don't, How long does it take now? We've done it in as little as, you know, actually under seven hours. Um, but usually I would say, you know, uh, we've, we've gotten pretty good at it. I would say around nine is probably an average. As much as, twelve, as little as seven, as, as long as 12. When did you change that route to, instead of going out of Kappa? Well, that, out of Kappa we only did once. Oh. Yeah. I mean, we, we figured that out real quick. <laughs> so, and, you know, there's always, the, you know, I tell you, the learning, the learning on the water, you have to travel with humility. You have to prepare with humility. You have to travel with humility to cross that channel in a canoe, or in any vessel, for that matter. But um, it's very important that, you know, that we love each other, that we support each other, and we, you know, we get the support and help from the native community and the non-native community as well. So, and I'd like to, you know, with that, I'd like to raise my hands to all of you. 
can thank you for your participation and for all the love that you share. No, there's not. Oh, there was last time. There, yeah, there was. Two weeks ago. Oh, no. There a tamole at Scorpion? No. Yeah. Several months ago, because we just, we just picked them. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, was it a month ago? A month ago. Yeah, I guess it was about a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, we had. Was that well, when you used to cross? Yes. So yeah. where's it now? Um, well, one of them is up at the Res, and the other one's at Hendry's Beach, or the Pit, or a Royal Borough, <laughs> or the Tumult House. <laughs> <laughs> huh? In the back. Uh, yeah, they're made out of redwood. Do you have an idea where, um, historically, um, the redwood would have been harvested? Driftwood. Driftwood. Mm -hmm. Oh, driftwood. Okay. Yeah. And even, even today, the redwood logs still drift into Wima mm -hmm. or Santa Rosa Island. And um, uh, I tried to get um, um, one of the logs there one time, kind of half-heartedly <coughs> attempted, but my buddy over here just wouldn't get it my way. <laughs> Before we dammed up all the rivers, they, and they flowed down to the ocean. It was apparently fairly common to, to have large trees in storms, you know, fall down and eventually wash down the coast. Were you going to make a crossing, or do you think in the past when they did the crossing, they picked certain days when it was really calm, where did they just take off? Oh, absolutely. There, I mean, you know, right now, today, we pick the date. It's always the same weekend, and, and you know, and we go. But, you know, back in the day, you know, you'd go and, look, you know, look at the weather. You wouldn't cross if it was... We do that today, see, because we have to live by a calendar as, quote, modern people. But then also, you know, we have all of our family out... Um, on the island, you know, sometimes a week before we get there, and everybody's in uh, in, in the encampment. On we take over the whole whole Scorpion Harbor, the whole campground. So we have all those people waiting for us to show up, right? <laughs> so I mean, it's like you know, we do our best to try and make that happen. Besides Wainimi or the Channel Islands, what were other primary crossing uh, starting points where they were? Well, they paddled up and down the, the whole Shumash territory from Morro Bay all the way down to, the down, down to Malibu. Okay. Uh, usually they say they, they would, you know, the, the, the northern villages would paddle down the coast and, and then when they got closer to the islands would, would go out. But uh, I, I can tell you right now that the, the, the paddlers a thousand years ago, six, seven hundred years ago, were, were, were better paddlers than <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they would laugh at me right now. Huh? Yeah. was the, the ancestral route. Yeah. It was the shortest route from the mainland to the, to yeah. the island. Yeah. It was Point Magoo. Yeah. But the ones that were lost in Ventura, they, they, they say that, that they, they left Ventura early in the morning, paddled all the ways out to Santa Cruz Island, fishing all the ways out, and we're paddling back. So three men in each canoe did what, what we have about 20 men and women do, yeah. with support boats getting paddlers in, 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 in and out. Actually, they did double, because they paddled out and paddled back, and, and got caught in the storm and it's just uh -huh. about five, six miles out. Yes? You know, in the construction, they used tar, and they sewed them together and they show you how they made the planks? Or? They didn't use tarp. They, didn't they use used tarp. asphaltum and pine pitch. So when you, and the reason why I'm just clarifying that is because people say tar. Yeah. And you think of tar on the beach. And that's not what we use. And that's not what we use today. We use asphaltum that's really coming out of the, out of the ground, you know, out of the hills, out of the cliff side. Of and asphaltum is very much like, it's like um, roofing tar. You know, it's hard. Except for it's harder than ripping tar. I mean, even in the hottest sun, it doesn't melt. And that's why you have to add pine pitch in, in the right ratio to get it to right where you want it so that it, you can uh, mold it 
the way you want it, and the sun won't melt it at the same and time. And it heats over fire. It's a great glue. It's and they a, sanded yeah. the planks, dragging it on the sand? Or how did they sure. sand the sand? <coughs> how did they get the planks? I, I, I wasn't there, but Alan was, so let him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, in modern times, we would get Republicans because they're very rough. <laughs> shark, shark skin was, was, was used a lot. There's a couple of plants that uh, 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 make for, for good sand, sand sandstone. Uh, uh, so there were several natural you know, resources that, that, that they uh, uh, would use. But yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it, it was simple tools and just a handful of, of, of you know, materials, mm -hmm. and they were master craftsmen. But I said, uh, mm -hmm. I, I take my hat off to them. The young lady there in the back. You must meet me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to comment on the place name. If, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, Wainimi, formerly named Wainimi, actually means something like the sleeping over place, because it was used so much by founders who were going to leave early in the morning. Yes. I saw a boat uh, with reeds tied together. What's the significance of that? The reed boat. Totally boat. Tied yeah. together. No, no. Yeah. A tule raft. Tule reed boat. That was our tule boat. Yeah. What is what? Tule. Tule reed. They were temporary boats. Okay. Were they used mostly in, in, in streams and rivers, ponds and things like that. Uh, they, they would be an equivalent of, of an ancient kayak. So, you know. You would use it in, in, in calmer, calmer water and things like that. Yes. Um, you, there's a <laughs> question earlier about redwood. Uh, where exactly did you get the redwood for the boats, the uh, modern? My, well, my understanding was, I mean, the redwood would come from northern California. So like I said, in, in big storms, you know, that, that, that you know, wash down the rivers and, and streams and eventually come down the coast of, of California. But I, I, any soft wood uh, was... Was, was probably used. We so bought it the, from mills the, up north. The, the natural pine trees, uh, cottonwood. Oh, for, but the wood from this, yeah, we, we, we get it from lumber mills and, and things like that. We haven't done any dugout canoes. We used to make dugout canoes, so that's, that's on the list of, of things to, to do our, our younger people. <coughs> the, uh, a little bit off subject, but the uh, dictionary that was published for the two-match language. Can you give a little more background on it and how it synthesized to get published and everything? Where, the, where they got the history for the, and that, that's, the words or they came up? And I assume the one you're talking about is, is the, the San Inez, the Somala one. Um, uh, and I was talking to a few people. For those of you who don't, don't know, there, there's there's more California Indians and families like like mine and Ray's that we don't get anything from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, so you know we we what, the things that we do it's it's literally out of our pocket and our time and going out and trying to raise money and car washing things like this. San Inez <laughs> is a federally recognized tribe, so they have the casino and money, and they they were able to hire uh, one. I mean, there's several great things about Santa Barbara. Uh, one, UCSB uh, had several uh, linguists that basically dedicated their whole career to, to Chumash languages. So there, there were some linguists that uh, had, had studied the recordings, anthropolog uh, anthropologic you know, papers and things like that. And uh, uh, there's, there's one or two uh, two or three that have specialized in that, that most Chumash people have used as, as a resource to, to help relearn their, their, their language. Uh, so, and I'm getting old, Jan. Who, who, who is the gentleman that? Richard Applegate. R Richard Applegate, probably the leading uh, 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 linguist. Somala speaker, though. Yeah. Mainly yeah. a Somala speaker. So he, he helped, was hired by, by Sandy and his, and has helped them with their language classes, put together their, their dictionary. Uh, so that's how we've done it. Thank you. And just to clarify, um, you know, um, there are several different Chumash bands across the, you know, from 
uh, San Luis Obispo de Malibu, and they all had slightly different languages. So that that dictionary is not the Chumash dictionary. That chu that dictionary is the Samala mm -hmm. dictionary, which is the dialect of the San Inez band. Oh. So they're yeah, similar yeah. but different. Yeah. 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 A chirp was so important with, you know, the bee bunny and the, on, on the moon. But what about the building? Was the chirp used in building the canoes? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Chirp, chirp was, well, and, and also um, the obsidian, you know, was traded. I mean, you know, I, you know, okay, so how long have we been identified as Chumash? Late 1800s was first coined and not really used until really modern time before. I mean, how about uh, Mitumash? How about Canalino? You know, so it's, you know, even the, even the label as native people, Chumash, is really r relatively new. And um, so, but, you know, where am I going with this, you know, church story? But, um, um, but the, a lot of trade. I mean, I'm, that's where I was going with it. Is this is, you know, tremendous amount of trade in Indian country. You know, you know, before horses and trains and all that stuff. I mean, people walked. I mean, you know, there's beaten paths and old trails that, you know, um, anthropologists and uh, archaeologists, you know, know about that a lot of people don't know about. You know, but know about, I mean, because thousands of years of walking that trail. And, you know, for somebody to walk or run 20 miles is no big deal, you know, back in those days, or paddle, right? So, it's just, it, you know, it's different. I mean, I, I grew up here in Santa Barbara, so I mean, in, in, in 53, so I mean, I remember when the wharf was a working wharf, you know? I used to fish out of that abalone plant down the middle of that hole. You know, when all those working boats would come up and drop their loads off at the wharf, not at the harbor. You know, back in those days. Back when sandbar, sandbar used to break in the summer during my time. <laughs> Question right there. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, I was curious about the design of the canoes or the boats. And to what degree do you uh, keep it as traditional as possible as opposed to if you thought of a way to make the paddle a little more aero or hydrodynamic, I mean, is there any kind of, uh, you know, like, do, do you, are you trying to make the boat as traditionally designed as possible, or what if you found ways to tweak the design so it works a little Can't better? Speak do, you, do you allow that? Do you give yourself that latitude? <coughs> the, there was one slide uh, with uh, the oldest tamal, that we have. And that was Fernando Lombrado. He was standing at the end of it. He built that one in 1912. Probably most of the ones that, that, that Peter Howorth helped, helped build and the ones that, that we build, we're, we're still using at least Fernando Lombrado's drawings and notes uh, for, for most of them. But, but like, like anything and, and any craftsperson, anyone that's a, a woodworker will tell you, yeah, we're, we're tweaking it great. Ray and, and, and Reggie have, have tweaked uh, keels and, and, and things. Uh, uh, our, our paddles, we went with one original shape because it, it, it was uh, designed from a paddle that, that, was, that was found. Uh, and, and now we're, we're, we're tweaking some of, the, some of those paddles. Uh, 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 when you have uh, thunder and lightning, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm with the biggest, strongest paddle that, that we have. So we're, uh, that's, that's some of the tweaking. But no, Ray, Ray actually and, and, and Reggie Pagley have, have, uh, have, have probably done more on and any person of the ocean that sails will tell you, you know, you, you, you tweak just a little bit, you can make a big difference. You, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And uh, we'll... we'll uh, uh, We'll uh, continue to see six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve tamales here in, in the next, you know, the next generation, and, and they're, they're, they're going to be different. We had 20-foot canoes, we had 30-foot canoes, we had 40-foot canoes. Uh, we, we had 
you know, men and women paddling in them. So um, we're, we're, we're still learning some of the old ways and, and we're still taking some of our, our modern technology. Um, we, 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 we use modern marine glues and, and, uh, and sealers and they, they still leak. So uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're learning as we go. Thank you. Sam. One of these days, will you be paddling from one island to the next island and back again? Uh, o only to do a, an occupation a la Alcatraz, and we're not going to tell you when that will be. <laughs> <laughs> but if they can't find a damn airplane out in the middle of the ocean, before, they won't find us either for about a week or two, and we're going to take it over. Okay, one more. Let, are you asking Jan or me? <laughs> oh, this crazy? Thirteen thousand years old on Santa Rosa Island. And she, is that the oldest human No. On the Western Hemisphere, possibly North America. Yeah. Well, depends who you talk to. All right. Let's. Uh, I'm sure Alan and Ray will stay behind and answer any other questions. Thank you very much. Let's hear a big hand for Ray. Thank you to all of you for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you.